Hello and welcome to this edition of Nerdline News. Let's dive straight in. Yes, October has been and gone, and once again we had the Nobel Prizes. Half of this year's award for physics went to James Peebles for his contribution to the development of the Standard Model of Cosmology. The other half was shared between Michelle Mayer and Didier Kellos for the first observation of an exoplanet. Another physicist was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. John Goodenough shared the Chemistry Prize with the two chemists standing Whittingham and Akira Yoshino for the development of lithium-ion batteries. James Peebles' award feels like it was a lifetime achievement award rather than an award for one specific thing, which to me feels like the right way forward for the Nobel Prizes if you insist on the prize being limited to only three people. With modern science being done in teams of thousands of scientists, it is just not right to award the prize to only one. I got the call from Sweden at 2.15 in the morning on October 3rd of uh, uh, two years ago. And uh, the uh, voice at the other end said, it won't surprise you that this prize is being awarded to you, Rainer Weiss and Barry Barish. And I said, I'm not surprised, but I'm very disappointed. I was disappointed because the prize should have gone to the entire team, including as major contributors, the people here at uh, Cardiff who made huge contributions. This could not have happened successfully without the combined efforts of a very large number of people. And the Nobel Committee has not yet figured out that they have an obligation to educate the world about the power and the importance of collaborations on certain kinds of science and technology, uh, and that this can't just be done by a handful of people. Peebles won the award for his contribution on trying to understand the cosmic background radiation and was key to transforming the field of cosmology from a wishy-washy field which was rife with speculation to a high-precision science. Now, I was planning on doing a deep dive into the background of the Nobel Prize winner's work for this month's instalment, but if I'm honest, I am useless when it comes to all of this space stuff and I very quickly realised I don't understand a lot of it. We then look at Michelle Mayer and Didier Kellos and the first observation of an exoplanet. One of the more commonly known techniques used to detect exoplanets is by measuring the brightness of a star. When the exoplanet transits a star, the star's brightness drops by a small fraction. However, Mayer and Kellos used a different method. Most people would say that a planet orbits its parent star, and this is not quite accurate. What actually happens is that the planet and the star both orbit their common center of mass. It is all dependent on your inertial reference frame, really. Now, this means that the path of the star is also elliptical when viewed from our frame. So when we see it from one side, during one half of the star's orbit, it appears to be coming towards you and it is moving away from you during the other half of the orbit. And this is cool, because this results in the observed wavelength of the emitted light changing throughout the cycle due to Doppler shift. And we can measure this. Now, this is known as Doppler spectroscopy, or the radial velocity method, or more colloquially, the wobble method. This is the method that was used for the first discovery of exoplanets. Since then, other methods have also been developed, and today we know of around 4,000 exoplanets. Now, finally, we talk about John Goodenough, who won the Chemistry Award with Akira Yoshino and Stanley Whittingham for the development of the lithium-ion battery. I won't really go into the technology, but I would like to talk about this wonderful specimen of a human being. It is about time that this guy got a Nobel Prize. It has been nearly 40 years since he laid down the foundations of the lithium-ion battery, and his work has transformed society beyond measure. But then again, having to wait this long does mean that he broke the record for being the oldest Nobel laureate in history at the age of 97. And yeah, he still works as an unpaid emeritus professor at the University of Texas, trying to find an even better battery technology to address the problems in the energy crisis. Earlier this month, NASA revealed its new spacesuits, the Exploration Extravehicular Mobility Unit, or XEMU, and the Orion Crew Survival System. The XEMU will be used for the upcoming lunar missions, and mobility was one of the main points for the design of the suits. Now, this means that it will be easier for astronauts to interact with the environment and walk around on the moon's surface, rather than bunny hop. The Orion Crew Survival System is bright orange to improve visibility. 
But one of the cool features is that it can pressurize in case of emergency such that if there is a depressurization event on, say, the ISS, the astronauts can hop into one of these and stabilize the astronauts for up to six days. This also introduces scope for the suits to be used to treat decompression sickness. Another big factor in the development of these new suits is the sizing and fit. Last month, the first all-female spacewalk had to be cancelled because there was only one appropriately sized suit available. Fortunately, a better suit was sent up to the ISS and the spacewalk was carried out in October by Jessica Meir and Christina Koch. For once, there is a bit of good news when it comes to environmental stuff. This month, a study was published which shows a significant decrease in pollutants like nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, particulate matter, and ozone in the UK. With this decrease in pollution, there is a marked reduction in respiratory illness and fatalities. However, it is estimated that globally, approximately 4.2 million deaths per year are still attributed to air pollution. For all of those lovely people who claim that government regulation doesn't address the issues and it is ineffective, in a study the researchers can directly link the reduced air pollution and the consequent reduction in fatalities to public policy using a quasi-experimental design. The results of the study can be used to inform the next steps in reducing pollution. Now I must stress that this does not mean a reduction in greenhouse gases, which leads to our next point. With the summer in the Northern Hemisphere being well and truly gone, it is time for the annual reports on how badly we are fucking things up. The summer of 2019 has delivered a brilliant summer with not just one measly attempt at an all-time high record for the hottest day, but nearly 400 of them. And I'm not talking about the hottest temperature recorded on a given day. No, there were 1,200 of those. There were almost 400 instances of the hottest day on record being recorded. Here's a graph. The yellow bars indicate the number of instances where the hottest temperature for that given day in the year was recorded. The reddish ones are instances where the hottest temperature for the month were recorded, and the dark ones are the number of instances when the hottest day on record were recorded. Most of the instances were recorded in West Europe, and there was a few instances in Scandinavia and the northern parts of the Caribbean. Uh, measurements below 20 degrees latitude were not included. Now, there was a bit of buzz around it a while ago, and I missed out on covering this last month, but as the official publication date was after the previous instalment of Nerdline News, I get away with it. In October, a paper was published with the title, Experimental Replication Shows Knives Manufactured from Frozen Human Feces Do Not Work. I'll let that one sink in for a bit. Apparently, there is an ethnographic account of an Inuit man making the knife out of his own frozen poo to butcher a dog. My first response was, yeah right, citation needed, but then I read the introduction and it is pretty well backed up, at least the claim that there exists an ethnographic account, not necessarily that it actually happened. The experimenters then proceeded to test whether this could actually happen, so the lead author took some steps to investigate and I will read the methods and material sections of the paper. In order to procure the necessary raw materials for knife production, one of us went on a diet with high protein and fatty acids, which is consistent with an Arctic diet, for eight days. The Inuit do not only eat meat from maritime and terrestrial animals, and there were three instances during the eight-day diet that MIE ate fruit, vegetables or carbohydrates. Raw material collection did not begin until day four and then proceeded regularly for the next five days. Fecal samples were formed into knives using ceramic molds, knife molds, or molded by hand, hand-shaped knives. And all fecal samples were stored at 20 degrees Celsius until the experiment began. We procured pig hide, muscle, and tendons, and these were also stored at minus 20 degrees Celsius until two days before the experiments began, at which point we allowed them to begin thawing at 4 degrees Celsius. Minutes prior to the experiment, both the knife mold samples and the hand-shaped knives were removed from the laboratory freezer and further sharpened with a metal file. The knives were then buried for several minutes in minus 50 degree dry ice to ensure that they were sufficiently frozen before any attempt at slicing. The study was approved by the Institutional Biosafety Committee at Kent State University. Now the researchers then started cutting into the pig hide to see if it would work, and unfortunately it didn't. 
I will now read a part of the discussion. Countless ethnographic, archaeological and experimental observations robustly support the narrative that indigenous and prehistoric people are technologically resourceful, innovative and savvy. It is thus unsurprising that an ethnographic account consistent with this narrative, an Inuit person extemporaneously fashioning a knife out of his own frozen feces to survive the Arctic night, has been so widely and positively transmitted. Our experiments, however, tested the technological basis necessary to support that account, and our results suggest that knives manufactured from frozen human feces are not functional. Our results should be considered in light of our use of minus 50 degrees Celsius temperatures, a metal file to sharpen the blades, and a cold, hairless hide rather than a warm, hair-covered hide. The latter representative of a fresh kill. In other words, we gave our knives the best possible chance to succeed, and they still could not function. So yeah, it didn't work, but it did lead to a rather funny paper. But the nature of the paper did shed light on the discipline of experimental archaeology, where researchers test their ideas by physically recreating the conditions and the materials to see if their idea is viable. Sounds like fun. So that was it for this month's news. And thank you all for your feedback on the last one. And I hope that you have enjoyed this one as much. You will see me again soon with some other stuff. And until then, I will give you the lovely apocalyptic rave music I wrote for this. (laughs) 